I want you to follow with me as I'm going to read our text, verse 19, down to verse 23 of Colossians chapter 1. Paul said, For it pleased the Father that in him should all fullness dwell. And having made peace through the blood of the cross, by him to reconcile all things unto himself. By him, I say, whether they be things in earth or things in heaven, and you that were sometimes alienated and enemies in your mind by wicked works, yet now has he reconciled in the body of his flesh through death to present you holy and unblameable and unreprovable in his sight. If you continue in the faith, grounded and settled, and be not moved away from the hope of the gospel which you heard and which was preached to every creature which is under heaven, whereof I, Paul, am made a minister. Now I want you to look back with me for just a moment at verse 21 as I introduce our theme. Paul says, and you, he makes it personal. I believe it's applicable to the Colossians and to us right now. You that were sometimes, this is their past, alienated enemies in your mind by wicked works. Now here's their present. You are now reconciled. God the Father sent God the Son to reconcile a rebel planet. If you wanted me to describe the message of the Bible, that would be a great succinct uh, description of the message of the Bible, that God the Father sent God the Son to reconcile a rebel, rebellious, hostile planet. Now, the word reconcile is one of the five key words used in the New Testament to describe the riches of our salvation in Christ, along with the words justification, redemption, forgiveness, and adoption. You know, I'm a firm believer that every Christian should learn these words. And someday, I've been saying this for many years, but someday, Lord willing, I want to do a series on key words of the Bible. And we'll do a sermon on each one of these words. But these words are important for you to understand the richness of the blessings of how God saved you in Christ. So let me give you a quick definition of these five statements. Justification is God declaring the guilty to be righteous. In redemption, slaves are set free. In forgiveness, our debt is paid and forgotten. In the doctrine of adoption, strangers are made sons. And now, fifthly, in reconciliation, enemies become friends. Let me repeat that real quick. In justification, the guilty are declared righteous. In redemption, slaves have been set free. In forgiveness, our debt is paid and forgotten. In adoption, strangers are made sons. And in reconciliation, our topic this morning, enemies become friends. Now, Paul, in this context, I want to set it for you, is still talking about the preeminence of Christ. Back up to verse 18 at the very end of that verse. Paul says that in all things, he, that is Jesus Christ, might have the preeminence. Now, what do we mean by preeminence? The word preeminence means the most important place, the supreme place. We use the word prominence for an important place, but preeminence means the most important place. To many people, Jesus is important, but to God the Father, Jesus is to have the most important place in our lives, in our church, and in our world. So Jesus is to have preeminence because we saw at verse 15, he's the image of the invisible God. We saw in verse 16 that he is the creator of all creation. And we saw in verse 18 that he is the head of the church. Now, as we move into verse 19, Paul gives us one more reason for Christ's preeminence. Jesus is the one through whom the Father reconciles a fallen world. So you might say these are the reasons for Christ's preeminence. He's the image of the invisible God. Number two, he's the creator of all creation. Number three, he's the head of the church. And number four, he's the reconciler of all things. Not only does he redeem us by his blood, but he reconciles us back into a right relationship with 
God. And I, I believe that this is the greatest need in the world today. When God made Adam and Eve from the beginning, the book of Genesis, and He walked with them and had fellowship with them in the garden, and then sin came into the world because they disobeyed God. What happened? Adam and Eve were driven out of the garden. They were separated from God. And God had to provide coats to cover their nakedness, and an animal had to die and shed its blood for them to come back into fellowship with God. But they were separated from God and eventually died. So death and separation and enmity and hatred and division all came into the world as a result of sin. And God's sending His Son was a rescue mission to save us and to reconcile us and to bring us back unto God. Now from this text, I want you to see three truths about the supreme reconciliation. If you're taking notes, you can write them down. The first point is a little longer than the second, so don't be timing me. You're going to be freaking out thinking, he's going to get through three of these, we'll never get out of here. <laughs> I just thought I'd warn you, okay? Because the, 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 the main message is in this first point, here it is, the Father's reconciling pleasure. Verse 19 to 21. So if you wanted to outline this text, the first point is the Father's reconciling pleasure, verse 19 to 21. Now let's go back and read that passage. It says, For it pleased the Father that in Him should all fullness dwell, and that He made peace through the blood of His cross by Him, that is Jesus Christ, to reconcile all things to Himself. By Him, I say, whether they be things in earth or things in heaven, and you that were sometimes alienated and enemies in your mind by wicked works, yet, notice this at the end of verse 21, now hath he reconciled. Now, very important connective there. It's the word for in verse 19. It shows that the basis for the preeminence of the Son was the pleasure of the Father. You might say, please the Father that in Him all fullness dwell, and please the Father that He have preeminence because He is the reconciler of all things. So the Father's pleasure is the Father's will or plan. When it says in that statement, it pleased the Father, what does that mean? It means that this is the Father's will. This is the Father's pleasure. This is His purpose. That in His Son, Jesus Christ, should all fullness dwell. What does that mean? In Him should all fullness dwell. Well, let me tell you very simply, it means that the full essence of deity dwells in Jesus Christ. It means that He is every bit God as though He were not man, and every bit man as though He were not God. In Jesus Christ, and these are, th this is important, you've got to dot every I and cross every T. That Jesus was fully man, sinless, because he was born of a virgin. He didn't inherit a sin nature. Jesus never sinned. But he was fully human. He was tired. He slept. He wept. He was weary. He had emotion. All, all the things that we have, Jesus Christ had. He was fully human and fully divine. But he wasn't two people, one God and one man. He was one person. You go... I don't understand, neither do I. You go, but you're teaching this. Yeah, because that's what the Bible teaches. You know, if I could understand God, He wouldn't be big enough to take care of me. My brain's about this big, you know. This is what theologians call the hypostatic union. They like to give big names to these doctrines, and that means that Two natures dwelt together in one person, Jesus Christ. There's nothing more important for you than to understand the nature of Christ. Fully man, fully God. Let me give you one more statement to clarify this. His humanity did not lessen or diminish His deity. And His deity did not lessen or diminish His humanity. It's just as heretical to deny his humanity as it is to deny his deity. And he had to be both God and man to be able to reconcile them. It's almost as though when Jesus was hanging on the cross, he grabbed God and he grabbed man and he brought them together and they met at the cross 
of Jesus Christ. What a beautiful picture. Because He's the God-man, He can bridge the gap between sinful man and a holy God. So He is the reconciler because He is the fullness of the Godhead. Now notice the fullness there is in Him. Not around Him. Not upon Him. But in Him. 2 Corinthians 5.19 Paul says it this way, God was in Christ reconciling the world unto Himself. So that fullness of deity dwells, and the word dwell actually means to dwell permanently. So here's the point. Jesus Christ deity was Jesus Christ deity was fused with sinless humanity for all eternity. Did you get that? Jesus deity was fused with humanity for all eternity. That kind of has a rhythm or a rhyme or meter to it so you can learn to to quote that or memorize that. His deity fused to humanity for all eternity. He's the glorified God-man in heaven. Now, you know, a lot of times people say, well, I can't believe that a man could become God. And you know what? Neither do I. Because a man didn't become God. God became a man. And there's a difference. You know, a lot of people believe that they're becoming gods. Or they can, you know, find the inner divine essence. There's a lot of men who have aspired to become divine, but there's only one God who actually became a man. This is what Paul says in Philippians chapter 2. The being in the very form of God. Thought equality with God, not something to hold on to, but he emptied himself, not of his deity, but the display of his deity. And he took on the form of a servant. That means he took on full humanity through the womb of the Virgin Mary. And therefore, he became obedient unto death, the death of the cross. And Paul goes on in Philippians 2 to say, Therefore God has highly exalted him and given him a name which is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow and every tongue should confess that he is what? Lord. That he is Lord to the glory of God the Father. He is to have preeminence. So Jesus Christ has the fullness dwelling in in him. Now here's the question. Why would God become a man? And the answer is in verse 20 and 21. To reconcile all things. Now what does reconciliation itself mean? What's the meaning of the word? It means to change relationship from hostility to harmony. It's a change of relationship from hostility to Harmony. You know the Bible teaches that before our conversion, that man in a sinful state, that mankind apart from God, is actually an enemy of God, that we're estranged from God. And God is the one who reconciles. Now, here's a few important points about the doctrine of reconciliation. God is the reconciler. We are the reconciled. We never reconcile ourselves to God. That's a work that we cannot do. God reconciles us unto Himself, and we're going to see it through the death of His Son, Jesus Christ. And that's an important distinction. Otherwise, it'd be like any other religion, if you're baptized, if you're good, if you have communion, that you can somehow reach up by your good works and you can bring God down to you, but that doesn't happen. In religion, man is reaching up to God. In Christianity, God is reaching down to man. And God is the one who reconciles man unto himself. He takes away the enmity and the blockage and the obstacles so that we can be reconciled and brought back in harmony with Him. God removes the barrier. And guess what that barrier is? It's a little word with three letters. starts with the letter S. S-I-N. What's that spell? Sin. sin. You don't hear much about sin today. Oh, I can't believe the pastor's talking about sin. We're not sinners. The Bible says we are. Do you know the Bible even says if you say you've not sinned, you just sinned, you lied? I've had people argue, I'm not a sinner, and if you don't believe me, I'm going to punch you out. <laughs> Veins popping out on their neck, I'm not a sinner. Everyone has sinned. Everyone has fallen short of the glory of God. The Bible says there's no one righteous, no, not one. The sooner 
that we understand that, the sooner we can appreciate the God, idea that God wants to reconcile us even though we are sinners. Now notice in verse 20, having made peace through the blood of His cross. That's the means by which God reconciles us. The blood of His cross. That's a descriptive term to explain the death of Jesus Christ. Notice in verse 22, in the body of His flesh through death. So you have in verse 20, having made peace through the blood of His cross. In verse 22, you have in the body of His flesh through death. It is the cross of Jesus Christ. It's the apex of all history, both secular and redemptive. When Jesus came to redeem us and to reconcile us back to God. We can't reconcile ourselves. Only God can do that. You know, at the end of World War II, when we were in the South Pacific fighting the Japanese, you know that the war was over and there was the peace treaty was signed? Did you know that many Japanese soldiers were still hiding in the jungles on some of those South Pacific islands? thinking the war was still on and they're hiding in fear and they're looking for the enemy and you know they're eating coconuts and bananas and they're sleeping under the trees and they were afraid and and and, and some of them actually were there for months and years they couldn't get them out of the jungle they thought the war was still on you know a lot of people are like that with god do you know the war is over a peace treaty was signed at the blood of jesus christ and God is reaching out to you. You don't have to hide anymore. Come out of the jungles. Believe and trust in God. He's opened the door, made the way. So basically what happened was, is we were enemies and estranged from God. And the obstacle that kept us from God was our sin. And God took care of the sin issue at the cross. Now this does not mean that automatically everyone is saved. You have to repent and believe in Jesus Christ and be born again to be saved. It doesn't automatically save the world. And we'll see that in just a moment. But the war is over. The peace treaty has been signed. And now all you need to do is let the little white flag go up in your heart and turn back to God and say, God, I'm sorry for my sin. And God wants you to be reconciled. We can have peace with God. I want you to notice the object of reconciliation in verse 20. All things. All things. And then he goes on to say, in earth and that which is in heaven. That just about covers everything. Now what does he mean by all things? Let me tell you what he does not mean. He doesn't mean that Satan is going to be saved. He doesn't mean that demons are going to be saved. He doesn't mean that unsaved people, unregenerated people will be to heaven. There is a false doctrine known as universalism. Universalism teaches that in the end, no one will go to hell. No one will be lost. No one will perish. Even though John 3.16 says, God loved the world so much He gave His only Son that whoever believes in Him will not perish but have everlasting life. But you have to believe in Him or you will perish. You do not have everlasting life. So this statement, all things, isn't teaching universalism. As you compare Scripture with Scripture, you say, well, what is it? It comes in two categories. All things comes in two categories. Category number one, all created things. The creation, the cosmos. You ever wonder why there's hurricanes and floods and tornadoes and all of these natural disasters, we call them acts of God. Poor God's getting blamed for all of it. It's man's sin that brought it upon the world. Did you know that Jesus Christ is going to come back and He's going to reign on earth? And guess what? No more tornadoes, no more floods, no more famines, no more pestilence, no more war. He will reign on earth as King of kings and Lord of lords. There will be peace on earth. It's called the millennium, the thousand-year reign of Christ. And yeah, I believe it's going to happen literally. I believe Jesus Christ comes back in His second coming and that He reigns on earth for a thousand years. And the Bible says that at that time, they'll beat their swords into plowshares and their spears become pruning hooks. 
And nation's not going to lift up sword against nation. They'll not learn war any, anymore, that there will be peace on earth because Jesus Christ, the Prince of Peace, will be reigning on earth. I look forward to that day, don't you? When we pray, thy kingdom come. And we pray, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. That day will be fulfilled. So the restitution of all things is talking about the created world. In Romans 8, it says, the whole creation groans and travails, waiting for the manifestation of the sons of God. But there's a second category, more pertinent to this text, in verse 21, and that is sinners will be redeemed. And you who were sometimes alienated, enemies in your mind by wicked works, yet now hath he, what? Reconciled. So those who believe in Jesus Christ, repent of their sins, and trust him as Lord and Savior, they will be reconciled. I want you to notice what we were before we were reconciled. Our past, verse 21. Alienated, enemies, and living in wicked works. We were enemies and we were living in wicked works. The word alienated means estranged. Verse 21. It means that we were separated from God. Adam and Eve knew God, had fellowship with God. Sin brought separation. Paul says in Ephesians 4, verse 18, that we're alienated from the life of God through the ignorance that was in us and because of the blindness of our hearts. So there's that time before conversion when we were actually ignorant and blind and we were estranged and separated from God. Now, as we look at these points, just, just remember what, what, what it was like to, to be blind and ignorant and separated from God. Remember before you were a Christian, you just lived in spiritual darkness? You didn't know the truth and you were living in bondage, separated from God? Notice he says also that we were enemies. So more than just strangers, we were hostile toward God. We were at enmity with God. It means that we're actively opposing God and willfully breaking His law. Notice it involved our minds. Our fallen state affected our sinful minds. In verse 21, in Romans chapter 8, verse 7, Paul says, the carnal mind is at enmity with God. It's not subject to the law of God, and it cannot be. You ever met unbelievers that just get angry when you want to talk about Jesus? Isn't it funny? You can talk about everything else. Everything else. The minute you bring up Jesus Christ, yeah! What did you say? Jesus, ah! Hair stands up on their neck. I'd like to share Jesus. I don't want to hear about Jesus. Well, let's talk about Buddha. Yeah, let's talk about Buddha. That's good. Talk about Mohammed or Confucius or any other person, and yeah, yeah, we can talk about Jesus. Oh. They don't want to talk about God. They're hostile toward God. We're at enmity, we're at war with God. And then, thirdly, it says that we were wicked in our works. Wicked in our works. Verse 21 Enemies in your mind by wicked works. How sad. You know, this is what we don't want to believe. In our sinful, fallen, unregenerated state, man is alienated, enemy, and he is doing wicked works, and he doesn't want to accept the fact that he's a sinner. You tell a sinner they're a sinner, and they get mad at you. Sinners don't want to know they're sinners. People that are saints... They, 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 they know they're sinners, saved by grace. Story is told of a 17th century Christian woman. Her name was Lady Huntington. And she invited one of her friends, the Duchess of Buckingham, to hear George Whitfield preach. She received this reply from the Duchess of Buckingham. It is monstrous to be told that you have a heart as sinful as the common wretches that crawl the earth. This is highly offensive and insulting. I cannot but wonder that your ladyship should relish any sentiment so much at variance with high rank and good breeding. Ho, 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 ho. 
How many times have I met people that say, oh, I'm not a sinner. I'm not wicked. That's, that's just disgusting to, 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 to indict humanity as being in rebellion or sinful or separated from God. But that's the truth. That's what's wrong with this world. Have you ever looked at the world and go, what is going on? It's because we're alienated from God. We're enemies. And we're practicing our wicked works. We don't like that in our natural state. But notice this yet now, verse 21. So you go from your sinful past to your present saved condition. But now hath He reconciled us. Now the word reconciled is in the aorist tense. And I point that up because that means that it happened in the past and it has effect all the way into eternity future. We who were enemies are now friends of God. But why did God reconcile us? Here's my second main point, and I promised you they wouldn't be as long. My second main point is the Father's reconciling purpose, or it's answering the question, why did He reconcile us? What was His purpose in our reconciliation? And the answer is in the end of verse 22. I want you to see it. To present you holy unblameable, and unreprovable in His sight. That's what God was doing. The purpose of God's reconciling work through the blood of the cross was to present you someday in heaven holy, unblameable, and unreprovable in His sight. Now, true to the passage, I believe that Paul has in mind not our present standing, which we are righteous and holy before God, but our future presentation in heaven. You know someday you're going to be presented by the Son to the Father? And we're going to be welcomed into heaven? And when we do get to heaven, this is how God's going to present us. Three things. Holy. Secondly, unblameable. And thirdly, unreprovable. Now this holiness is the salvation's climax. It has three tenses. Past, I've been forgiven. Present, I'm being forgiven. I'm being made holy. And future, I will be perfectly holy. Guess what happens when you get to heaven? You're going to be totally free of sin. Praise God, hey? What an awesome time. Sickness, sin, sorrow, and Satan gone forever. Praise the Lord. And you'll be presented as holy. Now, we don't deserve that. We didn't merit that. We didn't earn that. But God reconciled us through the blood of His cross. Notice, secondly, that we'll be presented unblameable. Unblameable, verse 22. It means without spot or blemish. It's the total removal of sin and guilt. In Ephesians 1, verse 4, Paul said, According as He hath chosen us in Him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy without blame, before Him in love. And then thirdly, notice it, unreprovable. It means no charge can be brought against us. Isn't that great? This is a can you dig it verse. (laughs) We just went from enemies, hostile and estranged from God, living in wicked works. Now we're going to be presented holy and unblameable and unreprovable. When we get to heaven, no one's going to accuse us of anything. Hey, I remember John Miller in high school. Just this week, I saw a picture of me in high school, and it just scared me to death. It's like, oh my gosh. Thank you, Jesus, for saving my soul. Amen? You know, there are going to be a lot of surprises when you get to heaven. You're going to be shocked at the people you see. And even more so, they're going to be shocked to see you there. They go, didn't we go to high school together? Oh, man, you are crazy. Can't believe you're here. I mean, people are going to look at you and have a... What are you doing here? What are you doing here? It's the grace of God. And no one's going to bring any accusation against us. Romans 8.1 says, there's now therefore what? No condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus. 
period. That's where that verse stops. At the end of the chapter, he says, who shall lay anything to the charge of God's elect? It is God who justifies. It is God who sanctifies. It is God who will glorify us. Notice it's in His sight, verse 22. Because we are in Christ, our future in heaven will be amazing. At the believer's death, when we go to be with the Lord, or at the rapture of the church, whether we go by death or we get caught up to meet the Lord in the air, this is how we are going to be presented to God, holy, unblameable, and unreprovable. We're waiting for the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ, who shall also conform you until the end, blameless in the day of our Lord Jesus Christ. Let me give you my third and last point. It's in verse 23. It's the Father's reconciling proof. So we have the Father's reconciling pleasure. We have the Father's reconciling purpose. And now we have the Father's reconciling proof. Notice it, verse 23. If you continue in the faith, grounded and settled, and be not moved away from the hope of the gospel, which ye heard and which was also preached to every creature which is under heaven, whereof I, Paul, am made a minister. Now, a very important word in verse 23, it's the first word, if. If you continue. Now, when you get to that in the English translation, without knowing the grammar behind it, you might say, well, I knew that there had to be a catch to this. This is too good to be true. He took us wicked sinners, and he's going to present us to heaven, unblameable, unreprovable. But you know what? That, that, now it's up to me to hang on. There's a big if there. Oh, it's up to me to hang on. It's up to me. You know, he saved me by his grace, but I got I to gotta stay saved by my good works. That's not what he's saying. That little tiny word if right there in verse 23 is what's called a conditional clause of the first class. A conditional clause of the first class. What that means is, Paul is saying, if and I believe you will. Changes the whole thing. He's not questioning whether or not they're going to continue. He's saying, if and I believe you will. Some translations actually render that since. And it would be right to do that. Since you continue. So he's assuming their continuance. He's not saying that you could lose your salvation. He's affirming them and saying, since you continue, and I believe you will, being grounded and settled and not moved away. But having said that, let me say this. Continuance in the Christian life involves my mind being educated by the Word of God. It involves my heart longing for God and seeking after God. And it involves my will being surrendered to God. You can't be passive about your Christian life. Evidence that you're truly saved, you're going you're gonna to want to read your Bible. If I meet someone that claims to be a Christian and they never read their Bible, I have, to, I have one thing, and that's all. I just have, I have to question, have you been born again? Nature determines appetite. How can you be a child of God and you don't want to read God's Word? How can you not hunger for God's Word? If I meet somebody who says, I'm a Christian, but I don't like Christians. I'm a Christian, but I don't go to church because Christians are creepy. The Bible says, we know we pass from death to life that we love the brother. Do you love other Christians? Are you committed to other Christians? Are you involved with other Christians? This is the birthmark of a Christian. But it's also continuing. Now, let, let's look at each one of these grounded in verse 23. Each one of these, by the way, come from the world of construction. It's like building a house or a building on a solid foundation. This is our Christian life. It needs to be grounded. I would say that's the area of the mind. We get grounded in God's Word. Remember when Jesus closed His Sermon on the Mount? He gave a parable of two builders, one wise and one foolish. Remember the foolish builder? What did he build on? Sand. Every kid in Sunday school knows that. They sing it. <laughs> foolish man built his house upon the sand. Then it went splat. The wise man built his house on what? The rock. 
which is the Word of God and obedience to it. Jesus said, my Word and obedience to it. There's not enough to hear the Bible. And you're to be commended. You're in church this morning and you're hearing God's Word. We read the Bible and I've explained the Bible and now I want to apply the Bible. And that is you must put it into shoe leather. You must build your marriage and your life and your job and your career and your hobbies and your habits, everything on the Word of God. Because the wind's going to blow and the rains are going to come and the storm's going to come and it'll beat upon your house. Some of you that have been married for many years, you know that your marriage would not have survived if it wasn't built on the rock of Scripture. Amen? And the, and the fear of the Lord. So be a wise builder. Be grounded on the Word of God. And then the word settled. The word settled means to be strengthened from the Holy Spirit and the inner person. And it would involve the heart. It's a heart that is filled with the Holy Spirit and, and has purpose to seek God, settled and grounded. And then thirdly, not moved away. I love that figure of speech. Not moved away. In Ephesians 4, verse 14, the Bible says that we no, be no more children tossed to and fro with every wind of doctrine. We, we, we know what tumbleweeds are, right? You know what a tumbleweed is? Tumbleweeds break their root and the wind comes and it just tumbles and it just goes rolling, right? God doesn't want Christian tumbleweeds. God wants Christian oak trees. He wants your roots to go deep in the soil of God's love and God's Word. Not be moved away. Now, notice the reference in verse 23 to the Gospel. The hope of the Gospel you heard the gospel. The gospel was preached to every creature. So the next Sunday, we're going to be looking at Paul, the minister, the preacher of the gospel. But I, I want to end with these thoughts. Number one, you know what we are called to do and to be as Christians? We're called to do and to be ambassadors for Jesus Christ. And you know what our message is to enemies, to strangers of God? To people living in wicked works? Through the blood of the cross, God has signed a peace treaty. You can come back to God. The war is over. Come out of the jungle. That's our message. To go everywhere we can go to our family and our friends and let them know you can have a relationship with God. You can come back to God. God dealt with your sin at the cross and now you're free to come back to God. You can be reconciled to God. We all love the, a beautiful story of a husband and wife who maybe have been estranged. I, I heard the true story of a husband and wife who had a five-year-old son die, and through the death of their son, they were estranged. They ended up in divorce. And years later, the husband had to return to that city on a, on a, on a, on a, a job-related business trip. And he went to visit the grave of his son, and as he was there weeping over the son's grave, he heard steps behind him, he turned around and there was his estranged wife. And his first impulse was to run away. But instead he stopped and she stepped up there and they grasped hands. And they were actually reconciled by the death of their son. They were reconciled at that cemetery over the death of their son. True story. In a different way, but every bit is important. God gave His Son to die on the cross so that sinners can be reconciled back to God. Do you know that God is literally reaching out His hand to you as sinners right now? He's saying, be reconciled. So we take that message, and I want to give that message to you that are here right now this morning. If you're here, maybe visiting for the first time, or maybe you've come for many weeks, or maybe a friend invited you, but you are not saved your sins have not been forgiven. If you were to die right now, you don't know you'd go to heaven. I want you to know that Jesus died on the cross for you. I want you to know that Jesus rose again so that you can be forgiven and that you can be reconciled back to God. And there's no reason for anyone to leave this service right now without getting right with God. You can leave here reconciled to God and you can have the peace of God. You can have the forgiveness of God and the joy of God. And you can have the hope of heaven. But it's your decision. I'm God's ambassador calling you to be reconciled to God. But you must make a choice. You must surrender in your heart. 
and come to Jesus and say, I'm sorry for my sins. Please forgive me. Come into my life and be my Savior. And if you haven't done that, I want to give you that opportunity right now, right here, to invite Christ to come into your heart and forgive your sins. If God has spoken to you through this message today and you're not sure that you're a child of God, maybe you don't know for sure that if you died today that you would go to heaven, you've never really trusted Jesus Christ as your personal Lord and Savior, I would like to lead you in a prayer right now, inviting Christ to come into your heart and to be your Savior. So as I pray this prayer, I want you to repeat it out loud right where you are after me. Make it from your heart, inviting Christ to come in and be your Lord and Savior. Let's pray. Dear Lord Jesus, I'm sorry for my sin. I pray that you'll forgive me and come into my heart and make me your child. Fill me with your Holy Spirit and help me to live for you all the days of my life. I believe in you. I receive you as my Lord and Savior. In Jesus' name. Amen. If you prayed that prayer and you meant it, God heard that prayer, and I believe that God will and does forgive your sins. We'd like to help you get started growing in your walk and relationship with Jesus Christ. God bless you. If you just prayed with Pastor John to accept Jesus as your Lord and Savior, we are so excited for you. And we'd like to send you a Bible and some resources to get you started in your relationship with the Lord. Simply click on the contact link at the top of the page. And tell us something like, I prayed to accept Christ. We'll get your Bible and resources mailed out to you right away. God bless you and welcome to the family of God.